You've got one paper going to that, you know it's working, and you turn it off from your computer, it's not going to be there. Okay? I would love to actually scan the request the source.
very last minute last couple of minutes uh, and Cameron to come join me uh, just for their fears of so alone up here. Uh, but I think the intention is that we should have um, you know we've got half an hour which is very much time. Uh, if possible I would like us as a room to reflect on um, what challenges um, we're facing uh, to encourage greater awareness of what open access is and why it's important academics and to see what we might be able to do as a group to address the question of get out of the in my views the main purpose of the session. Uh, I'm not going to um, uh, spend too much time um, uh, talking at the beginning, but I guess just to get a sense of the conscious of the room, who here um, knows what open access is? <laughs> so, uh, does anyone not know what open access is, or is anyone not sure? Okay. Um, so, I guess, uh, just very briefly, just so we're all the same age, um, uh, starting with a few definitions. Um, uh, Peter Suba, who's a, a great veteran in the open access uh, movement, uh, has a sort of very brief and cursory definition says uh, open access literature is digital, online, free of charge and free of most copyright and licensing restrictions. Um, uh, the Public Library of Science uh, says based on open access, free availability and unrestricted use. Um, there is some contention about the definition. This is sort of an ongoing dispute about the value, I'm sure, um, about open access. There are many different varieties, flavors, and, uh, and sort of discussions about um, uh, licensing. But, but I think uh, I'd like to avoid going into too much of that uh, today, of course, in a lot of substantive discussions, uh, and focus on uh, two things. What are the issues at the moment towards uh, greater adoption, and um, what can we do uh, to, to address uh, some of these issues? You know, to track, to <coughs> uh, so I guess just again uh, to get another. How many people here want to count themselves as a researcher? Cool. Right. Uh, how many people are who count themselves as an affiliated researcher to an academic institution? And how many people would count themselves as an unaffiliated researcher? Uh, so I guess, right, it's a good conversation. Everyone knows open access is for most people. Uh, I guess maybe uh, we would start with a quick way around the room uh, of uh, what some of the issues are, which have ideas for things that they currently think are the most important um, issues. Um, then we can, uh, hope you can see this actually. I'm, I'm taking notes on the uh, session Etherpad, uh, which I think you can get access to through. Um, in any case, I'll, just, I'll, I'll um, create a bit of link at the end of the class. We'll take notes here as we go. Um, but based on what the issues are, and then we'll just address them. Um, maybe one of them is this by way of introduction. Cameron and Lisa might start us off with some ideas. What some of the issues are, then we can maybe take some ideas that we've got. Well, um, just as background, we've been working on open access for about 12 years now, and um, we helped to develop something called the Luminous Open Access Initiative, which first defined open yeah. access. And so it's just um, really uh, wonderful to see that so many people in the room are aware of, of open access now, and our researchers who are really um, uh, can take advantage of it and can also make their own work open access. And, um, but going forward, I think that one of our main challenges is to develop alternative metrics of academic evaluation, which then can um, help to promote open access more. Because I think now, especially with young career academics, it's very uh, difficult um, for some to publish in open access uh, because many senior promotion committees uh, still don't necessarily embrace um, the outputs of open access at this time. So that's something we've actually been working with Cameron on for, for seven years now. And I can personally, but also um, public library science has been doing a lot of work in this area. So I guess I'm leading on from that. It's, it's been an amazing couple of years. Mm -hmm. 
was involved in open access advocacy. Um, the shift from maybe three years ago, when there were a few leading institutions that really took a strong position on this, the Wellcome Trust, Medical Research Council, NIH, um, and some institutions, um, Harvard, uh, Queensland University of Technology. But it was, that was the place where it outlined organizations. Today we've reached a space where pretty much every major funder in the world has at least some sort of statement or aspiration about making research more widely available. Many, many institutions of research um, have policies, um, some of them have but none of us have policies. And I think we're moving to a stage, I mean, you guys are all going to be familiar with the uh, life cycle and, and you know, paper that's crossing the chasm, and how we get into the mainstream. Um, the policy lever that we have, I think, has more or less played out. We've reached the point where top down um, requirements. For increasing access to research outputs. Um, we've got almost as much as we can. We need to move that now to a mainstream grassroots movement um, where this is just part of the practice of research. And to go back to the kind of Christmas analogy, you guys and, and those who have been involved, we're the early adopters, the enthusiasts, the ones who were active and who were going to do this anyway. The people we need now need to reach are those early mainstream adopters. The people who are not, who don't enjoy the new group. The people who want to understand how this is going to benefit them directly. How is this going to be a benefit to my research? And so that question of measurement and showing that by working to make research more available, you get a benefit as a researcher, whether it's through more citations, whether it's through more usage, whether it's through more media coverage, whether it's through the fact that your research is better covered and better adopted into the, the, the framework of Wikipedia to the internet section. So that's about metrics, it's about adoption, it's about measures, but it's also about learning from communities like the Wikipedia community as to how you build from a small group into a mainstream adoption. Um, and that's, to me, the really big challenge is that question of designing community instructions that will take us from small groups of, of people who have been really active in the great work to this just being part of how research is done, because that's just the way it is. I wonder if we can now um, maybe take a few suggestions from the floor about um, what are the issues that we face, um, you know, for example, with our institutions, amongst uh, colleagues in our discipline, or just the sort of uh, academics that we know? Yeah, I publish about the stuff for a while as well. So yeah. can you speak up? So can you all hear me? Yeah, um, I, I put a lot of stuff online, and I work with um, other people with perspectives of the writers to put stuff online. But I guess, for me, it's the more really, really serious stuff. It's the stuff I'm interested in. The problem that I don't work to the sort of degree of quality that you get from journals. Now, if I'm doing something really, really serious, then there's a pecking order of journals, and you, and you go for those. And, uh, and I just published a book, and I didn't publish it online. I went to a respectful publisher, and uh, I did it. And there's still a status in the cafe to having something published in, in the journals or the uh, publishers that everyone knows about. I don't know. And I'm fully in support of open open access and open knowledge, but that's the way we stand. So basically the, the, the trust and the reputation that accrues around the publisher still... Correct. Um, uh, it's still it's, there. Yeah, it's still there. And that's, that's still a real challenge. That's why it goes back to questions of you know, questioning those hierarchies, measurements that might let us ask questions about whether those hierarchies are actually based on real things. Um, but also, and that's another whole conversation. Um, but I think also this, this focus that we've had, with, with particularly with looking at how art, what's, what's important about an art? Um, in this country, we find it problematic when people get medical treatment based on what those code they do. Um, it seems odd that we judge research, the individual piece of research. Um, by the company it keeps the rather than the qualities of the research yeah. Another question? Yes. Uh, I'm Aaron Kaffee.
you know, it, it caught me off guard because I don't, I don't think that you need to convince researchers. As a researcher, of course I want people to have access to my stuff. It's, it's just that the publishers that are available aren't terribly interested in that, and the publishers who are want thousands of dollars from me in order to publish in their journals. And so I, I, I'm in the same situation where I, I put what I can online, but I can't really reach out to, to, to my peers without going through these publishers. So, so I just want to say you're, you're reaching to the choir. Um, I don't know what I can do about that. Well, you know, there's, there are two routes to open access. One published in open access journal, and the other to post an article in an institutional or special based repository. And that's an avenue that is sometimes forgotten, but many journals have been going through this I actually allow um, an article to be published in their journal to be deposited in an institutional repository. And that's another way. I also saw you had a presentation yesterday and I thought well, there was something that I thought was really exciting about that was that you said, you know, you said, here's a journal article, you won't be able to read it, but here's my summary, which I think is just, that's just a wonderful thing to be doing to see that another route into the work of people who perhaps aren't really looking for a research project. And then I think you did say you also had the actual manuscript online somewhere as well. So, you know, I would say if that's doing a lot, and I think the unfortunate truth is that there are many researchers who don't care enough to do that. And that's, that's the point. We won't get people to that point. And then, then we can really have the, some of the, the conversations that are going to be difficult um, about you know, what is the right communications infrastructure to be using. And, and you know, it's the thing that I was talking about, I mean, how are we going to pay for it? Um, and how particularly are going to pay for it for researchers outside um, traditional research? I think also it's worth noting, um, also in relation to the last comment, that um, uh, I, I find amazing that sort of humanities research myself how little people sometimes sort of reflect on the fact that the authority and the trust and reputation that often accrues around the journal of the book series uh, depends on the people who contribute to it, depends on the scholarly community who's around it.
those of us who are based in North America, you know, can we help um, without imposing our own history of problems um, on, on the challenges of public children, which are real, real issues we need to tackle. Um, but transparency and, and sunlight on those processes is a good place to start. Again, with Peter is a shiny example of transparency in quality insurance process. If we have any more sort of like issues, or like maybe actually, well, actually, well, we should definitely move on to <laughs> things that we can do as a group. And I guess um, maybe because time is running short, um, quick suggestions from uh, the floor about things that you currently do or ideas for things that you could do, um, regardless of whether you're a researcher or to remote open access and um, areas that you work with. I wonder if we can maybe just have a quick quick round, particularly like more creative or unusual things. Um, so um, I'm a postdoc at the University of Bath, and um, one thing we can really do that helps people is make people aware that there are fee, there are fee waivers and there are no cost open access journals. People don't seem to know about them for some reason, and particularly in paleontology, the area I work, Paleontologists have been absolutely rinsing the few waivers because most paleontologists don't have much money to spend on these things. And it's great. So um, a lot of paleontologists now being published across one page, and that's fantastic. And the community is really receptive to it because they get unlimited color figures, they get you know, unlimited page length. All the traditional journals only allow you black and white figures, they limit the, the, the length of the manuscript you can submit. So actually, it's been a boon to the science, not just um, the, the cost wise. So just simple things to make people aware of like that is really, really helpful. Great, okay, so make everyone <laughs> to make sure that everyone knows it doesn't have to be very expensive. Uh, on a related note, uh, in humanities, there are also many open access journals that actually don't require any fees from the author at all. And I think uh, many people in the humanities have heard about open access through people who are not in the humanities who are publishing hundreds of, 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 of hundreds of dollars to publish in the norm. So they think that maybe people who might also assume that they will need to pay hundreds of or, or thousands of dollars, which is of, maybe often not true in their case. So maybe there needs to be more awareness raising about the journals that are actually not asking people for that much money. Yeah, uh, I think awareness raising for various open access journals. Um, I'm also in history and also some frequently dismayed by the level of sort of digital illiteracy that is displayed by some of my senior colleagues, shall we say. So I think um, being the person who's from the internet and, and sort of talking about open access journals as a general um, general sort of package of like, look at the computer, it can do things. Um, and also uh, for people who may be um, more on the administrative side, getting open access journals into um, the compendia of uh, journals that count towards tenure, um, that's sort of a huge institutional thing that uh, can help change the metrics towards um, balance, towards value in open access journals on the humanities side. Great, so I think we've got one. Um, I'm an academic liaison librarian, so if you talk about awareness, I think librarians need to be educated. It's, it's librarians, we should be aware of open access much more. So, Awareness is extremely important for everybody, but I think it's extremely crucial for librarians. Um, so when I hear awareness, I always think, yes, awareness for librarians and librarians and librarians. So I think that's very, very important. Yes, and I just wanted to point out that librarians really have been leading um, the open access community from the beginning. We work very closely with the SPAR and SPAR um, yeah, having friends, uh, I'm not a researcher myself, but having friends in research in humanities and mostly in, in industry, um, there's one point where you talk about open access journals, etc., etc., but I think, at least with the situation in Germany, I would say, there, you come to a certain point where you also need to, to think about political activism. Because in the end, there's something uh, which you, you know, which is, is so, so, um, it's, it's the whole the whole process of publishing and publishing and publishing and there needs to be a certain time you need to look beyond the boundaries of, of, of science at least that's what I think uh, to have an uh, improvement on the long run so the public mission of, of research yes I, I, absolutely, I, just, I absolutely agree I think there's another form of activism which is really important so I've heard, I've heard, you know, I've heard the word tangible I've heard the word impact factor mm -hmm. um, 
I would highly recommend those of you who are in institutions show to your, do a Google search for Stephen Curry, yeah. Impact Factor. Read the blog post, print it out, give it to your senior administrators. Um, and that's a form of activism. And what that post says, which is a really important thing, is using the Impact Factor in any form of research assessment basically means you do not understand statistics. It means you're not a good researcher, frankly. Um, I think sending that message is another form of activism which will, which will change a lot of this. If we get rid of some of these facile metrics out of research assessment um, in institutions, a lot of this changes at a stroke. So I think we take one more and then uh, I, I would add that uh, if your university or institution doesn't have yet open access policy, that's also one thing you can try to get through. Like uh, we did this as students, uh, we love it. And not just because of that, but like that was also part of it. We, we managed to pass it our university. So that's definitely also something you can try to get people on board, collect signatures, you know, make a petition and so on, and, and really try to, um, try to change this. And for anyone in the student, Nick, put your hand up. Nick Chalky in the back corner there, for the organization called the Right to Research Coalition, um, which is to support students um, in open access and public access advocacy, and for a really great conference in Washington, D.C. on November the 15th to the 17th. There we go. Come so on. <laughs> yeah, it's called Open Time. You can find more information on <coughs> Open Time 2014. That works. So, of course, you only have half an hour. Short this week, <laughs> of I think um, the one final thing I would say is um, if you are interested in continuing to promote open access in your institution or in your field or just as a member of the public, uh, one way in which you can do that is to I've put a couple of links down uh, to mailing lists. Um, one is the open knowledge and open access mailing list, um, which Cameron and um, um, so many people have uh, gotten to move on, um, which has just been a way. Keep the conversation going, I guess, even though um, So if, if you do uh, want to do one thing, I guess, after this session, I would urge you to maybe uh, join up. It's quite low traffic, um, and maybe it's, and the other one is there's the global open access list, um, just to kind of keep track of the developments and see what we can do. And also, yeah, I hope that you look around and see which other are. Um, we, uh, I think many of you will continue to be in the conference. There will be another uh, session tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, and we're going to have some kind of open access, and maybe we can see if we can have some breakout sessions. So I think that's it. I'd like to thank uh, Cameron and Melissa for joining in such short notice. Um,
uh, is going through. Um, one, one thought uh, that I wanted to share with those for this is that Henry Hickson wrote a quote that popped into my head as Ken was talking, which is, there are a thousand hacking of branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. You might have heard this before, but it's, I realize there's a different way to read this. So on the first pass, you might say, there's one striking at the root. You know, if you're targeted, there's a lot you can do. But I think the lesson is also inverse, which is that there's also a hundred passes, a hundred additional hacks, you know, that it takes to sort of see where the root might be, for instance. Uh, so I really like this idea, and I want to encourage folks in terms of taking action to be bold in the Wikipedia sense. Be bold and try things out and experiment. And uh, you know, take, take that article and go to your administrator. Take, take that, uh, that research paper you publish in self archive and try things out and see what boundaries exist, and that's really the only way we can make progress. Uh, and I think this is a taking advantage of the most quickness of the agility of being able to my tools. It's an exciting opportunity for all of you. And you're a network. Realize that you can have the potential to leverage a network of that. Right? It's not just everyone in this room, it's everyone in this room multiplied. So consider, consider that. It's a, it's a growing process. Mm -hmm. So, anyhow, so any, other, any other questions? Uh, figure a way to link the two. So, Cameron mm -hmm. talked about different metrics mm -hmm. and how they impact vectors broken, and that if we should encourage other metrics, that also might sort of pull more interest in open access. So what about the being excited on Wikipedia metrics? That's actually one of our slides. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> the technology is good. Yeah, you can see it here. Yeah, actually, if you read the link, so everyone, you can see it all on your screens, but this fever, for some reason, doesn't really work. Um, and uh, so we will try to start introducing some of you can play around with this. No, I'll just to uh, I have to talk to the light, right? Okay. Um, so the topic of this session is signaling the open accessness of references sites on Wikipedia. Um, so what we have in mind there is that only when you read a Wikipedia article, there is um, the policy that uh, any segment in there should be supported by uh, a reliable source. And uh, then, so that we have a citation that is uh, brackets with a number in between them that brings the, uh, you down to the reference section. And then in the reference section, you may have a, a link or a DOI or uh, some identifier that brings you to um, where the source actually is. Many of those uh, trips will not actually bring you to the content of the source because there is a paywall and it's all in past. On the other hand, uh, if you go to a library, there is different uh, Sections. There's different things you can do with, with the books in the library. There's some books you can read on the spot. There's some and only on the spot. There's others that you can take home. There's others that you actually have, all, have to order from the basement or somewhere else in order to be able to read on the spot. Or, uh, and there's others you're not even allowed to touch. And uh, in a digital uh, environment, there is some equivalence. There is really uh, um, some publications that you can do th more things with than with other publications. And we want to actually signal this within the context of uh, references <coughs> on uh, site on Wikipedia. So what we're working on is, in addition to the normal metadata that is actually displayed um, on in, in the reference section, we will add information about the licensing of the, the article that is being cited. And if it is openly licensed, uh, then we will uh, import that, that's the plan at the, at the moment. We will import the full text into Wikisource and all the images and uh, video files and so on into Wikimedia Commons, and we will start a Wikidata item uh, from which all the different projects can then pull the metadata. And then uh, all this will be signaled in the Wikipedia page. So it's really across Wikimedia projects. And uh, we have a working prototype. We wanted to show it. Uh, well, even the doesn't really like the idea. Um, but um, the while, while doing this, we ran into a number of problems. First, it's very rare that we actually have um, projects or, or initiatives that work across multiple uh, Wikimedia projects, uh, each of which have individual um, policies, <laughs> cultures, participants, and so on. And um, but there's also a lot of opportunity in bringing those different communities together. And uh, so in linking this to the previous discussion, one aspect that I think is crucial in order to move open access forward is to emphasize uh, the things you can do with this uh, openly licensed content. And uh, Wikimedia projects as a whole are kind of the world champion in terms of reusing materials. Um, and uh, we 
should play that role more actively. And so what we have been doing over the last few years is actually automating um, the import of scrolling materials into our uh, Wikimedia project. So for instance, we have a bot that imports video and audio materials automatically into commons from the supplements of publicly licensed um, scholarly articles. We have now expanded that to the images so that uh, it becomes more and more easy to actually use those images uh, in Wikimedia context because you don't have to deal with the, with the upload anymore. And um, yeah, providing uh, like more closer linkages between Wikipedia and Wikisource and so might also help um, interlinking those communities more and we uh, may see a new way of interacting between those communities. Now that the demo finally works, uh, we can actually look at uh, one example. That's, uh, it's a static shot. Yeah, it's static. I can display one frame at a time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna, it's just think about this as having a very low frame rate. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so actually, maybe if you have a machine yourself, you can go to this URL, um, which is actually really difficult to... Uh, <laughs> between, okay. We tweeted it. Uh, yeah. If you look at the hashtag Wikimedia2014, you can find our tweet. Well, I'm talking specifically about the malaria page. So basically what we've done is we've taken... This is a mock-up. Um, uh, this one would be good. Let, let me do some more word stuff. If you go to the article on malaria in, on the English Wikipedia live, you want to see these things. Uh, that's the typical open access symbol. I feel like a little bit. Um, um, I feel like this one work. Oh, that's okay. yes, I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, if you look at the malaria article, you already see the, this symbol, this open access symbol, the orange lock that means. This is how the slideshow works. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, we just uh, kind of want to add more information on that. Yeah. And this uh, orange block has been used in a number of articles already. We introduced this idea three years ago with the research ah. newsletter. You can still see it. Oh yeah, leave it like that. Because here is here is the additional things that uh, we're working on. Um, so in addition to that orange block, we, we link to the full text on the source. Ideally, there should be a uh, link to the images. If there are images in the text, we import them as well. And uh, then the metadata goes on to the data. We now technically are able to do this. Um, so uh, a pilot uh, importing a few dozen articles into Wikisource has been run. We are now in kind of discussion with the Wikisource community whether they actually want this. And uh, also we will be discussing this with the comments and with the data communities. But technically we're capable of doing it. And uh, so uh, this is basically meant to be uh, the initiation of a more wider discussion like uh, how much calls to action do we actually want? How close do we want the interaction between the open access world and uh, the Wikimedia world to be? But in principle, technically, it's it's kind of solved. There's well, there's still some bugs to be fixed, but the principle workflow now exists. And we wanted to show the workflow, but since the video only allows us to show the slide, the slide every few minutes, it's a bit difficult. So uh, we might also. Um, to a more open discussion. So if some question has, or comment has come to the brain already, please pose it now. We will still try to fix those problems. Okay, no, no issues. So um, anyone here who likes the idea of automating uh, the reuse of open um, access materials in the media projects? I do. Well, you can be honest. You don't wish like that. Anyone who does not like that idea, we would like to talk to you. Well, give us the reason why. Uh, because uh, I'm thinking that uh, we have uh, some pages with hundreds of reference, so to put so much symbols uh, become uh, difficult to read the reference. This is my opinion. Well, summarize. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So the question uh, or the comment was that uh, in and Wikipedia pages that have lots of references, like this Malaria article has more than 100. And if we add all these additional symbols, it may be just overwhelming. And uh, yeah, we're very aware of that problem. Uh, that, so that's, that's why we are also thinking about um, minimizing the number of symbols. But uh, on the other hand, since open access is not as far yet as it could be, the problem is not as high as the European now. Because for instance, in this uh, malaria article, there is not, and right now, on the order of uh, 
30 to 40 of those, more than 100 articles that have this orange lock. And yeah. only a subset of these, like 18 of them, are actually open licensed. So out of more than 100 articles, there's only 18 that will get these additional symbols at the moment because the um, cited literature is mostly not open access yet because it was published in the past uh, when open access was just less common than it is now. And so um, it will take some time for this actually to, uh, to become a problem. And then this is a problem we most probably want to have, and then we will have some solutions. Can you use that the next slide, the next few minutes, please? <laughs> okay, so this is wiki. So this is a, this is an article that has been uh, automatically uh, converted from PubMed, etc., on Amazon Wikisource at the moment live. And on Wikisource, it does not have this uh, additional. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, and also it's being chopped off. But in the very right hand corner, you can see a sliver of an image, um, yeah. which is an image from the article, from the main article. And now, after in a, in a short 15 seconds, you'll be able to see the next one. Um, so, um, and then, so are you familiar? Is anybody familiar with Open Access Media Importer, which is a bot that's currently been running for about the last two years? We're basically, yeah, a couple. Yeah, a few people. Cool. Uh, so basically what that does is it imports, um, it, go, it scrapes the different open access articles for their different media um, and this does a similar thing. So whenever we get a, whenever we find a piece or an, an article, a journal article that should be uploaded, it um, automatically has its images loaded onto comments and I will show you a prototype now hopefully. Okay, so this is a, the comments category of all the media that came out of um, an article that about um, Plasmodium vivax on Venaria. So basically, this, this bot will automatically, given a specific DOI, and it also has the capability to just monitor Wikipedia for when new DOIs are cited, it will automatically try and find if they're open access, and if they are, convert them, upload the full text to Wikisource, take all their images and put them on uh, commons, and then also uh, create a Wikidata item for the source, which is uh, one of the last steps, which I'll... Plus it also uh, categorizes the files in commons. Uh, sorry? It adds categories in commons. Oh, that's right. That's important because many of you are uh, uploads, uh, the last get uploads to commons and have problems with categorization, but uh, the open access articles uh, they have already keywords supplied either by the author or by the publisher or by, by both. We make use of them and we also uh, check an additional uh, database uh, to kind of come up with initial bot generated categories so that it's easier for the humans on commons to uh, put them into the most reasonable uh, categories. And one of the last things that we want to do is, well, I just want, I want to point. Um, is we want to, and uh, also this is going to be a, in a panel uh, at 12.30, somewhere else, um, reform of citations. So instead of now always storing all our citations in plain text in the individual Wikipedia, we want to create Wikidata items for each citation um, and then have the semantic data mark in there. So one of the great things that you can have from, one of the great things that you can do when you have start managing your references in Wikidata, um, for instance. So this is the wiki, this is the article that we're talking about, um, determinants of relapse periodicity in plasmodium vivax. Um, it's live on regular Wikidata at the moment. And you can see that it has the um, statement it published in, and its value is Malaria Journal, which means that you can also click on Malaria Journal, which has a Wikipedia article about it. And then also you could reverse link and query, find find all the find all the uh, articles which are in Malaria Journal, which are used in Wikipedia as a citation. Um, so we, you could do some, some reverse query like that, and that would be really uh, that would be clever if you wanted to find some statistics. Or you say you also there was, there's also some uh, a dream I have about this, which is um, if you look at a Wikipedia article, one of the questions you can ask about it is 
what sources do I have to believe in order to believe this article? So you can get like a list of all the journals that you would have to have trust in in order to see, in order to believe the content of the article. So I think that would be something really clever we could do uh, if we started managing our references in Wikidata in that way. So that's what I have to say for that. Maybe you were up there. Yeah. What have we learned? It's kind of fun actually, the slides, right? This is how we used to do slides. <laughs> Single images. And, uh, and we used to do slides this way, right? With single images, and you would click a button, and very hot, and people. Um, so what we learned is that sometimes there are technical difficulties. Sometimes there are glitches. And sometimes there are social difficulties. I know we, we had a, our bot running on Wikisource, and it actually was blocked. And you know, we have to negotiate the territory of, of working with the community. And this is, a, I think, the presumption that we take, and that everybody should take when they're, when they're working on such projects and trying to improve uh, massive amounts of data and do things in new ways. And it's sort of a, it's part of the experience. We learned this lesson a lot. I think we want to encourage other people to also try to learn those lessons. Um, being experimental is really important. Uh, what we found, I think, is that there's a lot of open open questions and open problems along the way. For what we're doing, we find many sub problems that are sort of sitting there waiting for somebody to, to pick them up. And uh, I think if you would like to join us, you can join us both as developers as coders on GitHub. We have a range of different projects that we're contributing to and maintaining or not maintaining uh, that are sitting on our GitHub repository, which is github.com slash WPOA, so that's easy to find. Wiki Project Open Access. You can join us there. You can also join us on Wiki, uh, on Twitter, your favorite platform to communicate, whatever it may be. Uh, we're also just talk to us in person, especially about the prospect of using uh, Wikidata, expanding the coverage of, of Wikidata to include references and uh, source uh, metadata. Uh, so, Please join us, there's lots of more and new cool things that we can do together. Any more questions or comments? Yeah, Andrew? Um, I talked to you about this, I think, about a year ago. What is the position, I mean, you talked about signaling for, uh, the license. What is the position of using this for a green open access repository material, which makes it a very sizable fraction of the open access ecosystem? Yeah, the big problem with um, repositories is actually that the licensing is not properly signaled there, typically. We are actually working with one of the largest repositories of our scholarly literature, Public and even there, about 10% of the license information, like 10% of the statements about licensing are incorrect or contradicting themselves, which really makes it difficult to have a bot go through and do things right from a legal perspective. So you have to be really careful. And so, um, yeah, also many repositories, even if they use the same software like uh, eSpace or so, they are configured slightly uh, differently. And so harvesting across a large number of repositories is a big challenge. We initially, uh, when working on this, on Max Media Importer, we initially considered harvesting across a number of publishers uh, who are all producing Jazz, that is the XML standard in which things go into public central. But we discovered they are uh, so different that uh, we are better off taking the content from PubMed Central directly. Uh, also, one of the things that, that kind of came out of this um, work that was more or less unintended uh, is that we now have a working group that tries to standardize the standard JAX more uh, so that it's actually more reusable. Because so far, the focus in PubMed Central, like in many other databases, was on getting stuff in. That was the major um, uh, like aim. And people were not really worried about getting stuff out in an automated fashion large scale, because uh, the main target of those repositories <coughs> so far were human readers. But once the stuff is actually open licensed, you have many more opportunities to use machines to augment that experience. And in, we are now in a transition phase where this actually becomes relevant. And so there is now a working group of people who really understand uh, the technicalities uh, around that, who want to make it easier for people like us uh, to, to develop tools that actually allow to be used at the scale that we're talking about. So for, our, for instance, the Open Access Media Importer has imported uh, 17,000 files so far. That was only uh, video and audio material. If we're going for images, um, as we're planning now, this will be uh, two orders of magnitude more. So we're potentially getting hundreds of thousands of images uh, in the course of a year, all from academic sources, all peer-reviewed. And uh, yeah, if 
in, in the long term, the, the publishers agree to a more um, precise standard, then this can actually be um, better fit into the workflows of the media. We can be more precise in the file descriptions that we deliver to Commons, or uh, we can be more precise, for instance, about the author pages that we set up on the source. And uh, so this is an unintended consequence of uh, us just trying to reuse. We found that it's difficult, and now there is a number of people on the publishers and the repositories and who uh, are actually interested in getting stuff more reusable. Just want to show you. So I wrote, I wrote the bar here, and that's, this is just a cute side note. So relax your brain for a moment. Um, so yeah, so I, we wrote a tool that you can enter in any journal article, and it will upload its full text to Wikisource, and then. Uh, and its images to comments. And so sometimes I would wake up in the morning and just see what would have happened overnight. And these are some really nice pictures of frogs out of uh, an article about a uh, Rio Free, a specific type of Peruvian frog. And, uh, and then we were just, uh, you know, just waiting to both uh, smile at and put on the uh, Wikipedia page for Rio Free in the next, the next morning. So like, that's a nice, just cute success story. <laughs> Yeah, so I want to talk about this tomorrow with Cameron from the point of view of the grand vision of how this could fit in with how we communicate science to the world, which would be great. But one of the things I want to talk about that I don't know the answer to is what are the major blockers to making this happen better? So if you can tell me now, then I can recycle that and reuse it in my <laughs> session tomorrow. Yeah, that could be actually another talk. Um, yeah. And I've given such talks. The, the, the guess is there is um, different uh, kinds. Of there's technical, social, there's sometimes financial. Uh, and things that are in between. And uh, all of these have to be tackled individually. So, uh, so each of you give me your top three. <laughs> yeah, well, the major blocker at the moment is that jazz is not standardized. Another major blocker is that jazz only covers, well, the, the, there's only uh, a few disciplines that have actually large scale databases like Combat Central. I would like to have a Combat Central that covers all disciplines. And even in the sciences, we're not there yet. And even archive, um, which is kind of the archetype of a scholarly repository, doesn't really expose the license information. It has it in the APIs. So if you actually write it with the bot to, to crawl it, you'll see it, but the human reader doesn't see it. So that's three from you. <laughs> uh, three major blockers. Yeah. It's really different. Some. Uh, oh, just give me three. What, yeah. <laughs> well, one of the first one is the format in which you're forcing me to give you my blockers. <laughs> Second, points two and four afterwards are um, the, the community and also uh, like one of the tough things to get right is uh, communicating licenses over in, in JAX. So like you just get a, a string of what the license is and that's not easy. So computer readable licenses would also be helpful. Yeah, I would echo uh, quality of the source content and metadata of the source content, really not comprehensive. Um, additionally, uh, the, the uh, social and political uh, problems with sort of opportunities for change, uh, the prematurity of Wikidata. Uh, it, it's a, a double edged sword, right? You all have the chance right now to be a part of forming Wikidata, both in terms of what content it's going to manage and the future that it, it creates for itself. But on the other hand, that means there's an ambiguity about the direction happening now and a lot of, not a lot of clarity about what we're going to do. So that, that's been huge, and I think, yeah, it's more of an opportunity, but, but it is clearly a, a blocker and it's moving forward in certain aspects. Um, yeah, and then on top of that, I think maybe, uh, maybe taking the next step from, from what we're talking about here, um, pushing versus pulling this information around. And we've been discussing mechanisms of how that could play out to make it easier. So does everyone have to write a little bot to scrape Wikipedia to find out which DOIs are used, which, which worker IDs are used, which articles are referenced on Wikipedia? Or do we write one bot to rule them all and then publish it somehow? And is that actually more what people are waiting for and this sort of thing? To that, that's a topic of Jeff Lilly from Crosswalk's extremely exercise about. It's the start of the road. Jeff, yeah, do you want to comment on this? Or do you want to get back here? <laughs> Um, whereby um, rather than having lots of people going out and open different 
services, find out whether probably identifiers, whether they're ORCIDs or PMIDs or EOIs or query, that there would be a standard mechanism whereby any sort of site that was aware of the scholarly space and scholarly identifiers could easily determine from the identifier where it should report usage of that identifier and sort of link that with a scholarly impact mechanism to inform, for instance, Crossroads, that Crossroads DOI was cited or PMC, that a PMID was cited or work and then work it was used or something like that. So it's very early, but it's one of the ideas that we're looking at to try to figure out uh, whether we can uh, reduce the number of blocks that are going out for an API 65 million times. Okay, thanks. And to summarize that, there's already some articles that indicate, for instance, that there was a correction published to the article that the article has been corrected. We would like to extend such a system to uh, notice that the article has been cited, including from Wikipedia. And I've done some primary research on, uh, on the, like, uh, looking at Wikipedia citations. Like, it being cited on Wikipedia as, like, a, an also a different metric for different journals. And I've written a blog post about this on my blog. Uh, it's called the top most cited DOIs on Wikipedia. You can probably find it by Google search. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. this session on Scholarship One. Uh, I'm just giving a good introduction to open access and to relevance of Wikipedia. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank our speakers, Jonathan Gray, Karen Maylock, and Lisa Adman, Daniel Beechin, Matt Sennett, and Max Klein, and our social community at Media and the Bar Conservative for hosting us. The next session in this room is free culture one, we use, and we're starting at 11.30. One last thing, if anyone has a laptop, they can play for a while, but one of our speakers really needs one.
away from the Latino leaders. <laughs> 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 <laughs>